Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is good to be in the God's house this morning. It's good to see some of our students here as well. We're all kind of socially distancing, so uh, I think we're, we're all in good shape. So it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, and uh, uh, I know that uh, maybe for later, those who will be joining us through Facebook uh, Live uh, as we get our technology going, uh, but just want to just express how glad I am to be in the Lord's house. And I can resonate um, this morning with Psalm 27, verse 4, which says, um, because God is not only good, but God is beautiful. And um, that was something that this week I just, uh, as I was uh, having my personal devotions, and just, you know, just really just how beautiful God is. He's not just good, but he is beautiful in the things that he does for us and things he provides for us, not only his grace. Um, but the psalmist says, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Uh, so it is good to be in God's house, to be just with you, to fellowship with one another. Uh, and typically what we would do is we would all get up and we would just greet each other. Uh, so at this time I would just ask you to maybe look to your right, kind of give somebody a nod to your left and give somebody the nod. And that'll be kind of our, our hug or a little way, right? Just so we can do that. Even though we can't touch each other and hug each other, we can at least affirm each other and let, them, let us know that uh, we are glad to, that everyone is here this morning. A couple of a quick announcements this morning um, is uh, elders. We have a meeting on uh, 6 p.m. on Monday, uh, and then tomorrow TCE is having a um, work bee at 9 a.m. Um, uh, and then on a more delightful note, uh, this will be the second reading uh, for transfer uh, for Sarah Theoret. And so I know she is here. Uh, she's back there. Can you just like there? She's waving. Okay, everybody. So we are so glad you're here. Is there a motion to, uh, to accept? There it is. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand and just give her a big wave. And we're just so glad that you're here, Sarah. Uh, welcome to the family. At this time, uh, I'd ask you to just uh, bow your heads with me as we, uh, uh, as we get started in prayer. Father God, we come before your uh, throne to your house of worship this morning to praise you and to um, just give you our adoration, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise for your goodness and your mercy toward us. Uh, we give you thanks for all the blessings and we invite your presence to be with us this morning. Pray for your Holy Spirit, not to be just to fill these walls, but to fill our hearts. Pray that you would be with Pastor Dave as he brings us the message today. May the message he brings touch our hearts uh, and transform us uh, because it comes from you. And, and Lord, just uh, continue to be with us this morning and be with those who cannot be here with us today. Be with those who are watching us uh, through Facebook Live and uh, for the needs and challenges they face. May you bring them peace and comfort today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will be blessed. Um, I know I'm always blessed when Eva brings us the special music. Is this good? Yes. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's so good to see people at my church. The church is looking warm. It's warm outside for sure. And it's warm in here too. But not with heat, but with love. And um, today I'm going to be singing. A, it's a hymn that it's um, pretty common, but it's beautiful. And I always like to read a Bible verse, and this one is Hebrews 12, and it says, um, well, I'm going to summarize it to the point where I want to say, and it's like, how do we get through these times? How do we get through these times? And like I said last time, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiated and will continue to perfect our faith. So for God's glory, turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him death. Our sins in no more have dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely in the light of His glory. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. And the things of earth will grow strangely deep in the light of His glory and grace. In the light of His glory and grace. now time for our offering and tithes um, and uh, we know when we participate in the uh, gift of giving uh, and just uh, we come we come and with a grateful heart uh, to to God but I know that during times like this it's like when there's turmoil all around us it's hard to focus or sometimes we might be distracted and uh, the things you know just kind of begins to dim and as you know, Eva just saying, you know, when we focus our eyes on Jesus, when we focus our eyes on Him, uh, we can have peace amidst all the turmoil that we, you know, face ourselves. But we can also remember that uh, we have many things to be grateful. So this morning I wanted to ask, like, what are you grateful for this morning amidst all the trials? Anybody want to just, just, you know, maybe shout out or maybe just, is there something that you are grateful for? School, that's right, amen. Grateful to be with school with our friends, right? Anything else, anybody? What are we grateful for? This morning, um, I'd like to share with you from Lamentations, verse, chapters 3, verse 20 to 24. And it says, Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. In this crazy world, we can have hope because God's mercies are renewed every day for us. His grace is renewed every day. Um, and so with that graciousness, we come, what do we come with, you know, maybe a spirit of giving because we're grateful for what God has done for us. So I invite you, I invite the deacons to come forward and as we'll pray for the offering. Father, we give you thanks uh, for your loving kindness, for your faithfulness. And so, Lord, we just uh, want to be like you. And so we pray that uh, you would help us to be faithful as well. We pray that you would bless these offerings and these tithes that we return to you. We know that you don't need them, Lord, but um, we know that uh, you have plans for them to further your work. And so we ask that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles or your phones, I invite you to turn to them to the book of John, chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verse 26 through 30. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who, was the, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Good morning, church family. It's good to be with you, and I am so glad to see you here uh, at the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. And um, I know that we are still working on some technology challenges, and uh, that just kind of comes with uh, uh, com comes with how things are these days. But uh, if you are not watching live, if you are watching this later, we're glad that you are, are here as well. And uh, I know typically uh, we do have quite a few people that watch online. Um, as I begin this morning, I just want to uh, mention very briefly the, uh, the elders meeting on Monday. If you're an elder of the church, I really hope that you're, you make this meeting a priority, both because I want to get to know you and spend some time with you getting to vision together and pray together. Um, and I know that we are making uh, a virtual attendance possible if you uh, would per prefer to attend that way. But if you are comfortable coming live at 6 o'clock, we'll be meeting right over at the fellowship hall um, give me at least 90 minutes, uh, so don't plan on it being a quick one, um, and uh, I would really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to spending time with the, the elders of the church. I read, yet, I read uh, actually just this morning that yesterday marked the 50th day in Phoenix uh, with temperatures uh, 110 degrees or greater this summer, um, and uh, that actually... Uh, 
far exceeds the previous record, which I think was 33 days. 33 days was the previous record of number of days in Phoenix with the temperature 100 degrees or hotter. And this is just, this summer has blown that away. I want to thank you for that since uh, we are just moving here and uh, that type of climate, uh, it is taking a while to adjust to. Um, virtually every day that we have been here since moving here has been about that. I think one day uh, it only got up to be about a 107 or so. Uh, but every other day, it, is, it has been very, very warm. Uh, and it has had a little bit of moisture to it. Everyone says, you know, it's such a dry heat, so you don't notice it. There has been some moisture in the air. Um, and there's just something now, all of you who are accustomed to it, you love it, you just thrive in it, it's not a problem, that's, that's fine. Um, but since we're still adjusting to it, you know, there's a very debilitating experience to being in that heat. And uh, uh, I know several times we have said, hey, we're going to do some shopping. We need to run some errands. Hey, let's go. And we walk out the door. Yeah, raring to go. And you take one step outside and it's just, oh, and you, you just feel it hits you. And it just, uh, again, that's interesting. And you, you have to learn to work around it. Now, I have been where there is high moisture. I was in Washington, D.C. Um, a while back. And uh, it was only maybe in the low 90s. It wasn't that hot. But when, uh, when I felt that moisture, it felt like a warm blanket being wrapped around me. And I was only out, out, out in, that, uh, in downtown uh, D.C. for about three hours, but I probably wa lost three pounds of sweat and <laughs> just moisture. So it is different. It is different, but uh, it's hot. It's hot. When does it ever cool down? I mean, I keep hearing stories I keep hearing promises, oh, don't worry, you know, there's going to be that week in January where it'll be nice. No, it's, no, it's, it's fine. It's, it's going to be great. It's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. Um, well, uh, so much uh, that, that I want to share with you. I tend to speak kind of fast, and there's several reasons for that, not only because that's just kind of my personality, but I often have a lot I want to share, and I want to be very respectful of your time as well. Um, I don't want you to feel like you're just languishing in church. So I'm always thinking about uh, uh, keeping things moving and, and, and going. So I appreciate the fact that we record our services uh, so that if I do go too fast and you miss something, you're always able to go back and, and check that out. This is my first time with a PowerPoint too, so we'll see how that goes. I appreciate our, our technology team making that go. Now, how many of you remember this little tradition that I have kind of at the beginning of my service? You remember what I do? called a kids quiz. Now there's a few of you here today. I don't really define the age of kids. I just ask that they be actually children, minors, and I, I like to let the older kids, those over the age of 18, uh, just enjoy it. But we want to give the, the kids in the audience the first chance at interacting with us, and uh, we'll see how that goes. And so I, I would like to have some interaction at the beginning of the service. So if you just want to raise your hand, I'd be happy to call on you. And one day we'll get this even more wrapped up with uh, uh, microphones and things like that, but we'll take our time on that. Before I do that, though, would you join me in prayer? God in heaven, many prayers have been said, and we have dedicated this time to you already, but right now, Father, we just pause this one more time, recognizing that this whole service is about you, that our presence here and our worship is to come to grow closer to you, to know you better, and how much we need you today, Lord, and how much we have come to love and worship you for all the things you've done in our lives. Father, just be with us right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my, my quiz, oops, boy, did I mess that up? We're going to see if you were paying attention there, weren't you? It's all about meeting Jesus, all right? So uh, questions related to that. Who met Jesus at night? Oh, I see. You know right away. Uh, let, let me see if I remember. Is it Isabella? Isabella. What, who, who is it? Nicodemus. It's Isabel. Isabel, not Isabella. Hey, you knew that right away. You didn't have to think about it. You are... That's a great thing. Way to go. Yeah. So it's a rare story. Uh, Nicodemus being a Pharisee uh, comes to Jesus at night, obviously because he's probably embarrassed about his support and, and uh, wanting to know Jesus. But in this interaction, you have this uh, uh, very high ruler in the, in the Sanhedrin, a, a Pharisee or, or a well-respected ruler in Jewish society, who comes and he meets Jesus at night, and they have a very powerful interaction there. And we, we have many great stories from that. Question number two, though, we're going to go to another meeting. Who met Jesus by a well? Okay, we don't actually know her name, but we do know something about her. Okay, I remember Rachel's name. I don't remember your name. 
Amelia. Okay, Amelia, we're going to let Rachel go, though. Is that okay? <laughs> but thank you for sharing me your name. That was tricky, wasn't it? All right, Rachel, what do you have to say? It was a Samaritan woman. Sometimes we refer to her as the woman at the well, but there was a defining characteristic about her that's very important in the story, is that she was not uh, of the Jewish community, and that uh, has a very significant impact on the story as it uh, plays out. But she meets Jesus at a well, and we have many wonderful lessons to be learned from that story as well. All right? Number three. Yeah, you got that, didn't you? All right, I'm going to go ahead and ask it while they, uh, while they help me out with that. Oh, we got it right there. Perfect. All right, this one's a little bit different, but who met Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Who met Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus brings a few of his most closest friends up on the mountain, and there's a powerful experience that happens, and two additional characters appear, and they are by the name of... Oh, Evan knows. <laughs> what a gift some of the young people. All right, you told me it now. I've already... Emilia, Emily, 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 Emilia. Exactly. Amelia. That's what I meant. Okay, can you tell us? <laughs> you had it, you know, and then, then you got crossed over. So it was Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are the two that appeared to Jesus. And we actually happen to have an actual photograph of the experience right there. It's amazing. Not quite, not quite. Yeah, very powerful. Now, this powerful uh, vision and experience, that wasn't the first time that Jesus had met these characters, but for Peter, James, and John, they get to see this experience, and they're very wowed by it. And it's really a fun thing to think about. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? I mean, did Moses say, hi, it's me, I'm Moses, good to meet you, you know, fist bump or something like that? How did they know that's who it was? Well, we could talk about that another time, but that was an ov obviously powerful encounter, wouldn't you say? meeting Jesus and, and uh, these individuals, these powerful Old Testament personalities physically appearing so that Peter, James, and John could witness it. Okay, uh, a couple more. Who met Jesus while fishing? Who met Jesus while fishing? I want to see if any of our youngers will want to help me out with this one. Who met Jesus while fishing? You remember? I'll give you a hint. There's some of the disciples. Well, I, I I know Katie really wants to help out, but no, maybe not. Yeah, okay. I know. It's so wonderful. All right, Toby, I saw you raise your hand. Who is it? Peter and James. There's others. Can you think of any others? Who's Peter's brother? All right, we're going to go to the back here. John and Andrew, yeah, you got them right. So all four of them were fishermen, and in different encounters, in different stories, and in different circumstances. The first meeting of these individuals is Jesus walking along and seeing them in their trade, and him reaching out and saying, hey, uh, why don't you follow me? I'd love to be your rabbi. I'd love you to be my disciple. And of course they do, and, and they become fishers of men. And that must have been a very wonderful first encounter, and, and, and many wonderful things we can learn from that. Okay? And the last one, who met Jesus in a tree? Now, Jesus was not the one in a tree, but uh, Jesus met someone in a tree. And I saw Owen's hand. I'm so sorry. Is it okay if we let uh, Owen have this one? That is Owen, right? All right, Owen, shout it out. Let us all hear it. Zacchaeus, is he right? He is right. You all passed the test today. Isn't that wonderful? Zacchaeus, did you grow up singing the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man? You know, and uh, how many of you say Zacchaeus? You know, we can get into fights over these things sometimes, right? I grew up Zacchaeus, right? All these wonderful, interesting encounters with Jesus. Well, the reason, and by the way, that's the end. Thank you so much for the young people participating, being interactive. All these wonderful encounters I've, I've brought up because I think it's so important that we, uh, we learn how we meet people and understand the challenges of meeting new people. And that's one of the challenges that, that actually I and my family are, are having right now in getting acclimated to this church family. 
Because most of the natural and normal ways in which you or I would get to know each other and interact with each other are either limited or have been actually banned from us being able to do. And that's okay. There's a, a multi implicited way in which we can do this. But normally, we would be worshiping together with much more of the church family. We wouldn't have to look all look like bank robbers. Um, we could have you know, a, a greater ability to, uh, to get to know each other through facial recognition. We would have socials and potlucks, uh, do some visitation and things like that. And a lot of these things are either difficult these days or are um, you know, limited or not even allowed. And so I'm facing a bit of a conundrum of, how do I get to know you? How do I get to know you? Now, a, a worship service, even in this way, is one small way. I try to get around and say hello. I met Dwight and Leah, and it was good to, to meet them again. And then there were some, uh, uh, let's see, uh, M Emily and Natalie and Stephen. And I've forgotten Mom, but she's part of that too. And I'm glad that Lewis is here visiting us. So glad that you're here, Lewis. And then there's some of you else that don't really matter, but the rest of that's fine. And, um, but this is the challenge of how to get to know people. And uh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm learning, and uh, making lots of friends in the process. You know I'm kidding, you know. I love everybody. It's just love is what I do. Love, love, it's just amazing. What do you do? And so I've been just reviewing this experience in my devotion and time with the Lord, saying, Lord, how am I going to do this? Because a lot of what a pastor does is in relationship with people. Seriously, it, it is. It's not just about, you know, studies and, and uh, theology and things like that, but it's that personal investment and engagement with people. And so we live in a, a very different time right now. So I've been asking myself the question, how did Jesus meet people in that context? And what can I learn from that? And there is something that I would share with you today that, is uh, uh, really part of my, my message. Thank you. I don't know if I'm not uh, doing this right. Um, among many ways that Jesus met people, uh, through uh, his ministry and his work and his interactions, there is something that he did that I find uh, uh, instructive. This is just going to be a little unique. Is that he met people through Scripture. He met people through Scripture, and he introduced himself to people through Scripture. And so I want to illustrate that with you today, and I want to ask you to keep an open mind, and there will be an interactive part of this service toward the end, not necessarily something that you'll need to do at this very moment, but as you go through your day or your week that I would invite you to participate in. But I want to illustrate this with you through a Bible story of how Jesus used Scripture to introduce himself and how he used Scripture to get to know other people. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to go. I know John, uh, excuse me, George read from John chapter 3. I'll come back to that verse at the end of my, my message. But for right now, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 14. We're just going to go through this story a little bit and illustrate some principles and then uh, come back to this idea of getting to know people through Scripture. Are you with me there in Luke chapter 4? Um, if you got it on your phone or if you brought your Bible, or you can just listen along. I did not put it on the screen, so I'd like you just to listen or follow along in your Bibles if you had them. Uh, Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Okay, and it begins this way. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. Now, we need to get ourselves in the context of what's going on. Jesus, according to Luke's order of events here. He's just been baptized, been in the wilderness, and been tempted by the devil, and it was an extremely difficult time. Sometimes when you read the temptations of Christ, if you've read it over and over and you're familiar with it, it, it almost sounds like it was a cakewalk for Jesus, that he simply was just filled with power and filled with strength and said, no, Satan, this is what the Bible says. I'm not going to do that, and it's just a, a, a tremendous time of faith. When you read Desire of Ages, you realize this was an excruciatingly difficult challenge for Jesus to be fasting and depending on nothing but the, the Father and having the devil come to him in the appearance of someone who is coming to help him. And of course, that's a story for another time. But it's interesting that Luke, right after that experience, says there's something different about Jesus. He's going about his business now, and there is a power about him. The Holy Spirit is on his life in a powerful way. He comes out of that difficult trying experience, and he's more powerful and more energetic and more successful than he's ever been as he starts his journey. Now, Luke does not tell us everything that has happened up until now. You, you read the account, and Luke early on says, I'm going to give you an orderly account of Jesus' life. But he doesn't tell us everything. As a matter of fact, John in his gospel says, if I was to tell you everything about Jesus, the whole world wouldn't have enough books 
uh, to tell about all that's happened to Jesus. So there are some things that happened in the life of Jesus between the temptations in the wilderness and verse 14. And Luke will actually tell us about uh, a part of those events, but uh, we have to go to another gospel to figure it out. But here's the point. Jesus has been baptized. The Spirit has come upon him. He has survived the trial of the wilderness, and he is now doing ministry in a powerful way through the Holy Spirit. News about him is spreading around the whole district there. Verse 15, and he began teaching in all their synagogues and was praised by all. This is starting off very wonderful for the life of Christ. His ministry is moving. News about him is spreading. People are saying this is wonderful. We're hearing the stories of the miracles. We're hearing the stories of the baptism, and we're starting to wonder, could he be the Messiah? So it's starting off very good. By the way, it was very natural and normal for a Jewish rabbi to go to various synagogues and teach. It was not abnormal. It was expected. Any Jewish male had the right to speak in any Jewish synagogue. You didn't have to have permission. As long as you were a bar mitzvahed male, you could go to a synagogue and at any time ask for the, for the pulpit. All right? You could ask for the attention. That was how the Jewish synagogue operated. So this was not abnormal. This was very a, a customary way of a, of a rabbi to go around and kind of get attention too. Try to get some disciples to follow him. And it's working wonderful. Okay? Verse 16 is a phrase that, or is a verse that many of us are familiar with. It says, And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. When we study the Sabbath doctrine and when we're doing evangelism, we refer to this verse a lot to illustrate Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. That was his custom. That's what he was used to doing, and that's what he did here. He goes into a synagogue in his hometown. You've got to keep that in mind. He grew up in Nazareth. He, he'd probably been to this synagogue many times. This was his custom, Luke says. People probably recognized him. People probably knew through the stories, this guy that grew up here named Jesus, he's now in our synagogue, and he is uh, going to be part of, the, uh, part of the worship. Okay? So, and it says, he stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written. Now, before I read the verse, you have to just, again, keep yourself in the mindset of what's going on in the minds of the people. They've already heard the stories. They've already heard about some of the miracles, and they're already starting to wonder, could he be the Messiah? So you can already see that people are probably watching this, they're probably listening to this with a bit of bated breath. What's he going to say? What's he going to read? What's he going to tell us? What miracle is he going to do? Okay, are you with me? And so he reads from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 61 is where he reads from, and these are the words he says. And, and I'm, I'm sure everyone just started tingling when they heard it. Oh, boy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That same Spirit, the Holy Spirit that came upon him at his baptism. That same Spirit that, that gave him uh, success in the wilderness and was leading him now in power. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Oh, we like that. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives. All right. Recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are, to, who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The first thing Jesus says is he says, if you want to know me, you can know me through the scriptures. And by the way, this is something not necessarily profound because we know that Jesus you know, is the word, right? He is the word. He says, if you've read Moses, you would know about me because Moses wrote about me. He told the disciples on the way to Emmaus, he said, from, from Moses and through all the prophets, he explained the things concerning himself. So this whole idea of knowing Jesus through the scriptures is, is not revolutionary, something very common, something that we teach and we understand. But as the audience was listening to Jesus read, as they were uh, listening in expectation, they were hearing him say things that they were excited about. You mean he's come because we're poor and we, boy, we need, those Romans are taxing us. We, we don't even have anything. By the way, the Roman tax rate was about 75%, about 75%. So when you, com when you complain about your taxes that you're paying, just keep that in mind, <laughs> all right? And there was a lot of extortion and, and worse things beyond that. Oh, we're poor. That's, that's right. We need to hear, we need the Messiah to come and, and bring that wealth back to Israel. Mm, want it to set free the captives? Well, that's us. We're captives to these Romans. We're captives to all these problems. All right, and, and, and he's come to uh, 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 recovery of sight to the blind and set free those who are oppressed. That's us. We want that. We need it. The favorable year of the Lord. Yep, we've earned the Lord's favor. We know we need his favor. Up to this point, they're loving it. Okay, he's, he's introducing himself through the scriptures. And then verse 20, he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. All the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. These are one of those fly-on-the-wall moments, right? If you could just be there, you know, you can imagine just, you could hear a pin drop, 
right? He reads that, and it, it almost very ceremoniously, you can see Jesus and his actions kind of do that. He reads, it was, you know, probably a scroll, puts it down, sets aside, and then just kind of, what? What did I say? <laughs> and they're just waiting, right? Saying, what, what does this mean? What's it all about? And then Jesus says in those very kind of immortal words, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now they love it. They love it. It says, all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words which were falling on his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? Several things happening here. Again, you have to, you have to understand the context and, and by looking at the, the fuller story, understand what's kind of going on in the minds of the people. Now, at first glance and read, it, it sounds as though this is an authentic uh, uh, salvation and and eye-opening experience for these, these individuals in the synagogue that they have just now experienced a powerful moment with the Messiah and their hearts are filled with love and acceptance and they are just so excited to be part of this, uh, this mission of Jesus. They are so excited to have the Messiah in their midst. It seems and sounds like a very authentic experience. But then Jesus does something to reveal the fact that there's something missing. And so not only does he introduce himself through the scriptures, but now he's going to find out who they are by using the scriptures and by revealing what's actually going on here. All right? Now, keep in mind, as the story plays out, it's very evident that the people are gathering around Jesus, not for these uh, altruistic uh, uh, ideas that, yes, he's here for this wonderful, he wants to bless all the poor, and he wants to set free all the captives, and he wants to set free all the oppressed. What they were really surrounding Jesus for was for their own selfish de desires. They're thinking, he's come to set to give my wealth back to me. I don't really care about anyone else. He's come to set my family free. He's come to reverse the oppression that I've experienced, and I don't want to hear about anyone else being blessed. It's kind of like if you were to bring a couple dozen boxes of donuts into the dorm, you'd probably be very popular. You'd probably, people would surround you and say how wonderful you are and how, how wonderful it is to be your friend, but you want to know what happens when all those donuts disappear? I say, <laughs> I say, Who are you anyways? I Bring more donuts, then we'll talk. But other than that, I don't know. Up until this point, they're happy to be around Jesus as long as they think Jesus is going to bless them. And that's how the story plays out. So if you come back, it's, it's actually very interesting. We often think of this story initially because of the, the Sabbath reference as a very you know, nice time in the ministry of Jesus. But when you read on further, you realize it, it didn't stay nice. And so they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? They're thinking, could it really be possible that this kid we've grown up with is the Messiah? I mean, come on. Is that really what we're hearing here? And so Jesus begins to teach. Verse 23 is where I'm at of Luke chapter 4. And Jesus said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Now, this is one of the stories that Luke does not tell us about. But previous to this, John tells us about what had happened in Capernaum. In John chapter 4, John talks about this nobleman who came to Jesus imploring him to heal his son. And Jesus said, hey, I've healed him. You can go back home right now. Wherever he is right now in Capernaum, he's healed. And the nobleman on his way home finds out that his son is, has been healed. And it's a very powerful thing. And that takes place in Capernaum. And uh, John tells us that's only the second miracle that Jesus had done. So very early in his ministry, Jesus had turned the water into wine. And he had been baptized and the Spirit had come upon him. And he'd healed someone in Capernaum. And those stories had gotten out, and people, your ears were buzzing. And that's what Jesus is referring to here when he says, um, you, no doubt you will say whatever we heard done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So when Jesus said to them, no doubt you'll say, physician, heal yourself, he says, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if you're willing to heal people, strangers in another town, if you're willing to do miracles elsewhere, if you're willing to be a physician to others in other places, won't you also do that here? Won't you also heal people? This is your hometown. These are your people. You grew up here. You have an obligation to also do those miracles and those healings and those works of power here. That's what they mean when they say, physician, heal yourself. And he said, uh, whatever you'd heard done in the Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And then Jesus begins to reveal more about what's going on. He says, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. 
And again, I could talk long about this, but just keep in mind, virtually all the stories of the prophets that we have in the Bible is when God is sending them to their own people. Elisha was sent to Israel. Uh, Elijah was sent to uh, Israel. Jeremiah, Isaiah. There are cases. Jonah went to Nineveh. Okay, I understand that. But most of the prophets were sent to their own people. And the work of the prophet was rarely this. Rarely did a prophet come and say, David, I am a prophet from the Lord. And I have come to tell you, David, this is the message of the Lord. And here it is. Are you ready? You're a beautiful man. It's all wonderful. Everything you're doing is great. And just keep it up. How many of the prophets had messages like that? The work of the prophet was usually correctional. The work of the prophet was usually disciplined. The work of the prophet was to bring a reconciliation and, and a, a reminder to where people have gone stray. This is why nobody wanted to be a prophet, right? Because they knew it was a tough job to tell people when they're struggling and they need to come back to the ways of the Lord. And, and, and uh, Jesus is simply recognizing that and says, no prophets welcome in their own hometown because they know that the message they're going to bring is one of change. Are you with me so far? Two of you are with me. I'm so happy. The rest of you, I know this is kind of advanced, so you'll have to watch the video later. Now here's where it comes, though. Here's where Jesus is going to reveal through the scriptures what's going on. Verses 25 and, and following. He says, I say to you, I tell you the truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the sky was shut up for three years and six months, a great famine came over the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And what Jesus is simply saying, do you remember, you who know the scriptures, you remember this guy named Elijah? Well, there were many widows that could have helped him. There were many widows in Israel that could have been the comfort that Elijah needed in his time. But none of those widows were willing to receive and understand the mission of Elijah. So I had to send him to a foreigner. He had to go outside of Israel to find anyone who could actually supply for his needs and be a blessing to him and for him to in turn bless them. And they're going, uh, I didn't expect to hear that. And then he says in verse 27, there are many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And what Jesus is simply saying is, you are too focused on yourself. You are too focused on wanting the blessings of God only for yourself. But if you knew the scriptures, you would know that God cares about everyone. God cares about everyone. And when there's not enough receptance and faith among my people, I have no problem sending my prophets to others. Now keep in mind, they're in church. This is the synagogue. This is the Sabbath, the Holy Sabbath, in the town in which he'd been raised. Now, notice what happens, verse 28. And all the people, how many of the people? All the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. I did not want to hear that from the Messiah. I don't want to hear this business about other people receiving the goodness of God. And you begin to see the xenophobia and the racism and the isolationism of this community. And Jesus uses the scriptures to show them that, that they have lost the context. Now, you know, in sports they have a saying, yesterday's hero is tomorrow's bum, right? You notice how quickly these people turn on a dime? You know, in sports, one day the guy can hit the home run in the bottom of the ninth and win the game, and everyone's just, this guy's the greatest ever. We love him. Give him more money. He's just wonderful. The very next day he could strike out, and what are people saying? Get this guy out of here. He, what a loser. Of course, you would never do that. I understand. But that's very common. By the way, not just in sports, in business. The successes you have for today, you know, you got to have success tomorrow too. Uh, in, in, in many times in relationships, it's the same way. Okay, this is kind of the human nature. But notice how quickly the story changes. Just a few minutes ago, they were saying he's wonderful, and they were wondering at the graciousness of his words, and now they're so mad at him, they're ready to commit murder. So remember what I said earlier? It seems like an authentic worship experience in church. Jesus speaks the scriptures, and they're just loving it, and then all of a sudden you see that their hearts have been so twisted that even at the thought that the mission of Jesus could be for others was enough to make them 
commit murder. Now, I've never been led out of the church and led to a, a hill <laughs> and been attempted to be thrown off. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> it says they led him to the brow of the hill in, in which their city was built in order to throw him off the cliff, but passing through their midst, he went their way. What did he do? All he did was tell them a Bible story. Is anything that he said inaccurate? Did he misquote the story? He simply was saying, you don't understand the role of the Messiah, and I'm going to use the scriptures to illustrate that. I'm going to use the scriptures so that all who are will follow after will see that there is a real problem in the heart of God's people right now. And the Bible says that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. It would have been very easy for Jesus just to stop at the beginning and say, thank you for all this wonderful reception you've given me because I've read from Isaiah and you seem to like that. But he knew there was a deeper heart issue he had to address. And he used the scriptures to reveal that. Boy, I, uh, uh, again, we could spend so much time learning more from this, but I love this idea of Jesus interacting with people and using the Bible and using the, the, the knowledge of the scriptures in order to gain a better understanding of where people are going. So I want to kind of do the same thing of getting to know people through the scriptures. And this is how I want to do it. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll wrap this up quickly. But I, I do need your help in order to do this. I told you it's going to be a little interactive. I'm going to start by sharing with you my favorite Bible verse. Okay, my favorite Bible verse. Uh, and I, wanna, I want you to get to know me through the scriptures. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to help me to get to know you through the scriptures. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to share with you my favorite Bible verse. Now, this is not easy to do. This is like asking a librarian what their favorite book is or a marine biologist what their favorite fish is, right? Uh, now, or favorite cook what their favorite ingredients is. Now, some people can go right to it and say, oh, I know it. Absolutely, Tom Sawyer, it's the number one book. Nothing else compares. Some people can do that, you know, or, uh, you know, my favorite fish is whatever. But it's not easy for me as a preacher, and, and I can't promise you that this is my favorite verse for all time, but it has been my favorite verse since college. I'll tell you that as much. And, and George read it earlier, and of course, you all paid attention and loved it so much, you know what it is right now. <laughs> it comes from John chapter 3. And it comes from John the Baptist. And it's really just one verse. John chapter 3. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's pithy. It's short. It's, it's not a lengthy thing that requires a lot of explanation. In this one moment, in this one story, in this one verse, I see the entire gospel illustrated. I see the love of God. I see the law fulfilled. I see salvation. I see selfishness dethroned. And I see selflessness praised. I see John the Baptist at the height of his popularity say, it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's others centeredness. It's others first. And to me, that just envelops so much of what the Christian walk is. It's about God. It's about others. It's about Jesus. And I come second. Isn't that what the, the, the two great commandments, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, and then love other, your, your neighbor as yourself. It's all embodied in this one sentiment, in this one passage. He must increase. That's all that matters, is that Jesus has increased. He's increased in this world. He's increased in my life. He's increased in my family. He's increased in the church. If Jesus Christ has increased, then that is the goal. That is the gospel. That is the message. So for me, and by the way, that's mine. You can't take it. You find your own favorite verse. Okay? That's, that's my, my favorite Bible verse as I stand before you right now. No promises uh, forever and ever. Um, but let me tell you a little bit else about some things I appreciate about the Bible. I kind of have this saying, my favorite book of the Bible is the one I happen to be studying at the time. It is really hard. You know, there's just so much to, to, to love about the, the, the Word of God. It, it is sometimes a challenging thing to narrow it down. My favorite gospel is Luke. Uh, my favorite epistle is somewhere between 1 Corinthians and Philippians. I can't decide. Both of them have such a wonderful Christology that's unique that I'm very attracted to. Um, uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite psalm is Psalm 34. Are you getting this? Are you writing it down? Oh, that's okay. Just sharing you a little bit about myself. My, my favorite proverb is Proverbs 25, 11. 
uh, which says like apples of gold and settings of silver, so is a word spoken in right circumstances. I work in the industry of words, not just in sermons, but in counseling and in administration. And I just love that imagery of Solomon saying a, a right word spoken at the right time is such a beautiful thing. And so I, I just love how he says that, like apples of gold and settings of silver, so is a word spoken in right circumstances. My favorite patriarch is Joseph. My favorite Old Testament book is, is uh, Genesis. There will be a quiz after. That's just a little bit about me. But that's my favorite verse. So what I want to ask you to do is tell me your favorite Bible verse. But I have a very specific way that I'd like you to do this. And there's so many practical applications of, of I, I think, of how this is going to work. Um, tell me your favorite Bible verse by texting it to me. Okay? If you have a phone that you can text, by the way, you don't have to do this right now, but you can. Sometime in the next short amount of time, text me your favorite Bible verse. Okay? And this is going to have many, many benefits. One, I'm going to get your phone number that way. Okay? And I want your phone, and I want you to have mine, by the way. Text me, and if there's four of you in the family, and all four of you have a, 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 a phone, then all four of you should text me. If only there's only one phone in the family, tell me who the family is and maybe share it with, with me who uh, each person's favorite Bible verse, okay? But make sure you include your name, okay? I have to have your name. Don't forget your name. Put your name in the text. If your name isn't in there, I won't know who you are. So make sure your name's in the text. Don't forget your name. And I can guarantee you next week when I stand up here, I'm going to say about 20 of you forgot your name. And some of you are teachers, and you get assignments that are turned in without names, and you just want to pull your hair out, right? Okay? Don't forget your name. Give me your name. Give me your favorite text. And then tell me just a little bit about you. Tell me if you're a member of the church or just a friend of the church or a student, okay? If you're watching online and you don't really fit any of those categories, that's fine. Just say, hey, I'm from Colorado or, you know, or whatever. I'd love to know who is watching online, so you're welcome to do that too. But I, by the end of the week, I hope I have dozens and dozens of texts from you telling me what your favorite Bible verse is. And I'm going to read them too, by the way. And I'm going to learn about you. If you say, oh, my favorite Bible verse is, and the Lord poured uh, fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and killed everyone. That's going to tell me a little bit about you. I'm going to know more about you. You know, if you say, if your favorite Bible verse is about prayer, that's going to tell me about you, that prayer is so important. If it's about the second coming or if it's, a, if it's from the Song of Solomon, I know you're a romantic, okay? It's going to tell me a little bit about you and I'm going to get to know you better by knowing what your favorite Bible verse is. Now, before I, I wrap this up, I do have some off-limit verses, okay? Some off-limit verses. You are not allowed to use these verses, and I'm actually going to put them all up here. Yeah, that's right. Boo, oops. Yeah, you got it all, right? I didn't mean to go, <laughs> okay? Off-limits. You're not allowed, okay? John 3, 16, love it. Oh, mm, warms my heart, okay? Find something else. You know, there is no truth in the Bible that is only found in one verse. If you like John 3.16 and you cannot think of another verse, find some other place that says the same thing that John 3.16 does, right? Jeremiah 29.11, it's like become the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. You know, I know the plans that I have, I, you know, have for you, plans not for your calamity, but for your future and hope and all that. Beautiful. Love it. You don't get to use it. Off limits. All right, the love chapter, the Ten Commandments, the Shepherd's Psalm, Three Angels' Message. If that's your favorite passage, I love it. I love that you have such confidence in the plan of God for his church in the last days. You don't get to use it. Find a different passage. And if you need help, I'll tell you where other places can be found for these same sentiments. Okay, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. If David Wallace is watching this, I apologize. I know this is your favorite Bible verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will establish your paths. Beautiful. Love it. You don't get to use it. Okay? Romans 8.28 is simply because I have a pet peeve about this verse. It's probably the most misquoted and misunderstood verse in the Bible. For, all, for God causes all things to work together for good for those that love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Beautiful. Most misunderstood, most misquoted verse I think I, there is in the Bible. Okay? Don't use it. Don't use it. Find someplace else that says the same thing if you love it. Derek, are you with me? Okay? All right. We're, we're together on this. And, uh, you know, Genesis 1-1, I just threw in there because there's a lot of people that like to get out of things easy, right? Oh, the pastor said I got to do something. So. 
Okay, find something else. Now this is also going to show me a little bit. I'm going to get your information on my phone, and you'll have my information. I'll have your name, and I'll have your favorite Bible verse, and that's going to be wonderful. I'm also going to find out how obedient you are to your pastor. I'm going to find out how many rebels there are out there. I'm going to find out how much power and authority I really have in your life by asking you to do this assignment, and that's going to be very helpful to me. Is anyone confused about the assignment? Is there any problem? Now, by the way, not everyone has a cell phone. I understand that. If you do not engage in this type of technology, email me. That's fine. Send me a letter. Okay? You can call me. Okay? I understand. By the way, I, I love the fact that you can have my cell number, and I want you to know you can call any time, night, day, any time. You can call George. You can. And then, uh, then he will let me know later about your great need. And that's wonderful. No, I really don't mind. You, you use my cell number. That's what my number is, and it should be that uh, for the perceived future. And let me know. Don't forget your name. Make sure your name's in there. Don't leave out your name. I need to know your name. Do not text me without your name. Have I made that clear? And then let me know what your favorite Bible verse is and a few other things about yourself. How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> First, last name, title, suffix, suffix, social security, credit card. I need it all. Yep. And we won't have a problem with the income anymore. <laughs> Oh, friends, it's so good to worship with you. I do want to get to know you in all, in all sincerity. Uh, you know, ministry is about people, and that's what Jesus really illustrated in the story. He has come to save people, all people. He does, no one is out of, out of the hope and love of Jesus, and that's what his church should be about. And I look forward to journeying with you as your pastor, as your fellow believer, as someone who wants to come alongside you and help all of us come to know Jesus better and to be a light to our world in this very dark time. So let's get to know one another, okay? Again, please, before next Sabbath at least, don't forget, let me know a little bit about you, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that we can come here and be here. Thank you that many will uh, watch digitally and be able to participate that way. Thank you for those who've come here today and have been willing uh, to, to pray together and to worship together and to learn together, Father. I pray that this would be and continue to be a wonderful day in your presence. Thank you for the students that are here, Lord, as school has just started. Um, thank you that TCE uh, gets to meet uh, in in-person classes uh, this next week, Father. I pray that you just be with the staff and the teachers. I pray that you'd be with the students, that you'd be with the leaders, the board, Lord, be with us as a church as we go about your business and all the ministries that we, are, um, that we are engaged in. Help us to see your plan in all things. Father, thank you for this church family. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Hope to see you again soon.